thank you to our panelists and thank you to everyone coming here tonight and joining us virtually. It's a great night, at least for me in Green Bay, because it's really, really rainy. So it's the perfect time to be inside on a Zoom call. Uh, but yeah, we're all very excited for you to join us uh, as we hear from young folks, uh, climate activists, uh, community leaders throughout Wisconsin uh, who are doing as much as they can to combat climate change at the local level, the state level, the federal level. So we're gonna hear from them, their stories, how they got involved, uh, their theories of change, um, as well as how you can become involved in helping their efforts, uh, no matter your age, whether you're young or old. So we have several different panelists. Um, and what we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Ariana to have everyone introduce themselves. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Ariana Hones. She, her, hers. I'm the Southeast organizer with Wisconsin Conservation Voters, and I see some familiar names. So hi, everybody. Happy to see you um, be in this space together tonight. Um, so yeah, I am going to introduce us all to our amazing panelists. Um, we're going to start with Amon Jote. And then we will go to Molly and then Stephanie. And I'm just gonna have you introduce yourselves, say your name, where you go to school or work, um, what year you are, if you're in college, your major, um, and then just an explanation on what you're doing to address climate change in your community. So Amanjot, I'll, I'll kick it over to you to start us off. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanjot Carr, she, her pronouns. I live in Brookfield, Wisconsin, and I'm a rising senior at Brookfield East High School. Um, I have been mostly involved in climate and political activism for the past two years since my sophomore year. Um, and most of the stuff I've done is volunteering for the Sunrise Movement and then um, working as an election fellow for Wisconsin Conservation Voters. I've also done research through my school on environmental education in the Milwaukee area and how we can involve environmentalism more into school curriculums in college. Awesome, and then Molly, I'll have you go. All right, hi everyone, uh, I'm Molly. I am an incoming senior at the University of wisconsin Siemens Point, um, which is crazy to say, it's my last year. Um, and I'm studying ecological and urban planning, um, which basically means I'm focused on sustainable community development. And I recently become really passionate about building local food systems um, and just how we build networks through people um, to provide um, equitable food. Um, and so I, um, I have mostly been involved through the, in my climate activism through an organization that I founded called the UW Divestment Coalition. So this is an organization um, that I started back in March with my friend. Um, you know, when COVID first became what it was last year. Um, and what we are focused on is having the th uh, 13 UW campuses and the branch campuses divest our endowment from fossil fuels. Um, we have a total endowment of over $7 billion um, invested, not just in fossil fuels, but in total. Um, and so we um, work on um, divesting that money. Um, I personally work as the team coordinator. And so I am um, basically people management. I don't do a lot of the actual work, but I do a lot of the recruitment and getting people involved. And so I love um, getting people excited and jazzed about climate action. And I love just like putting them where they feel like they can be most useful and like giving them the confidence uh, to do what they need to do. Um, I think I hit everything. <laughs> okay. That was amazing. Yes, thank you. And Stephanie, we'll we'll kick it over to you. Um, hi, y'all. I'm Stephanie. My pronouns is you or hers. I go to the University of Wisconsin Madison. I'm a rising or like junior. I have been involved in the climate justice work or activism since like my junior year in high school. It's been a long ride. I was co-founder of the nonprofit called Youth Climate Action Team. Later on, I was I became part of the Wisconsin Student Climate Action Coalition here at UW Madison. And later on, I was chosen to be part of the 
Governor's Climate Change Task Force as the youngest member, which sounds crazy to say, but <laughs> thank you for the applause. Um, and yeah, I guess I like, you know, even with all those like big names and big organizations I've done, I've also been at like a lot of small protests around the Madison area and being involved in like, you know, a lot of like nonprofits and works. Wonderful, thank you. All right, I'll turn it back over to Casey to, to get us started with our questions. All right, thanks everyone for introducing yourselves. And I'm gonna ask for uh, all of our panelists to introduce themselves just a little bit further because I think it's really helpful for uh, everyone in attendance to kind of know what initially got you involved in climate activism and what's your story and what is the why behind the work that you do. So again, we can just go in alphabetical order and we'll start with Amit Chow. All right, so uh, since I, I'm like the youngest person here, a lot of my interest in climate activism was when I was really young, like around 12, 13 years old. I first watched a lot of documentaries on Netflix and that's surprisingly enough what got me into recognizing how dangerous climate change really is. Um, one of the ones that really stuck out to me was called The True Cost and talked a lot about um, how society is run on the exploitation of natural resources, especially the fast fashion industry, for example. And so one of the things and issues I care a lot about the most is making our economy and making our economic system more environmentally friendly. So when I was in middle school, I obviously couldn't do much about that yet. So I kind of just cut down my personal consumption and I tried to learn more about it and donate to organizations as much as I could. Like when the Amazon wildfires happened for my birthday, I just raised money to fund as much as I could for organizations for those instead of getting presents or anything. That was more what I did at first. But in high school, um, when my school and Brookfield opened up a Sunrise Movement division, I joined right away. and. I've been involved with different like political organizations and nonprofits and volunteering for them as much as I can, while also getting other peers involved and managing volunteer teams so that people are more aware of how climate change impacts our daily lives and are getting the word out about these issues, whether that's through attending a protest or through um, calling voters or calling people and letting them know about eco-friendly candidates. Um, that's kind of what I've been doing in high school to get more involved in climate activism. Uh, Molly, over to you. Yeah, I, um, first of all, I'm on I think that that's just like so inspirational that you started this whole thought process in middle school because I was very similar, right? Like I grew up in a, I grew up in a city. I did not grow up like doing anything outdoors. And I feel like as a student in the, in Stevens Point, a lot of students in the College of Natural Resources are very like, grew up like with this deep connection to nature and that's how they came to this this you know where they are and i didn't have that i started watching documentaries in high school um actually no the first one was i was like 14 and my mom had put on food ink for me and she was like you just got to learn about this and i remember like sitting there watching this documentary and i think it was the first time i realized like oh my gosh adults don't know what they're doing and we don't have it figured out. And like, that was such a crazy realization as a kid because you think that these adults just know what's going on. Um, and so I think it's awesome because I kind of sat on that for a while and I, I didn't do much in my community at all until I got to college mostly because I didn't grow up in an area that had a lot of resources. Um, it wasn't really anything that people talked about. Like climate was not a discussion. I remember in high school one time I had like my bamboo like reusable like cutlery for lunch and my friends like made fun of me and were calling me a tree hugger and stuff so like it was just not something I talked about until I got to college um and then I just like popped off like I I joined the student organization 350 Stevens Point um, my first semester um, and then they were working on campaigns for um, stopping line five and line three and the back 40 mines and um, Foxconn. And so that was my first exposure to any and all of this. And um, just in general, like how much 
impact people can have on a local level. Um, because I had just been watching these overwhelming documentaries and I was like, well, like, I don't know what I can do. Um, and so that was my, my main first exposure. Um, and then I gained a lot of confidence through working at my campus's Office of Sustainability. My boss was is still a big inspiration to me, but um, one of those people that really just makes me um, question things and have the confidence to stand against the grain and say like, yeah, this should be uncomfortable. And like what I should be doing is uncomfortable because I'm going against what our society is built on. Um, and so that has really um, been something that sticks in the back of my mind as I'm doing the work that I'm doing. Um, but yeah, and then I got the confidence, like I said, my junior year to, to co-found an organization, um, which was just a huge milestone for me um, to get me to where I am now. Thank you. And yeah, we can go to Stephanie now. Sorry, I didn't know I was muted. Anyways, um, yeah, I, I really applaud y'all for like starting this whole like constant, like thinking about the environment from my middle school level, because to be honest, I was born and raised in Honduras, which is a small, small Central American country. And we didn't get taught none of this like idea of climate change. And it was just so small in my circle. And later on, when I came to the United States, and it wasn't until I took a like biology course that I was like, wait, kind of like what Molly said, like adults don't have it figured out. <laughs> they really don't. And so the more I started learning about it, the more I started realizing like, wow, people do not engage the identity of, you know, being from a third world country or a woman. And so I thought like my role playing as an activism was not only to like advocate, you know, and inform people, but also to show like, if your climate activism type of work does not include racial justice, that is not climate activism. And so sooner or later I started realizing like, wow, you know, like, I really need to be doing this. So I started like hosting like uh, a climate strike in Madison with the youth climate action team. And that's what really get us started. And that's when I, I was like, you know what? This is what feels right to me that I'm gonna do the rest of my life. And that's why ever since I've just like continued staying with what my major like dictates, which is like thinking about the social aspect of like the whole environmentalism movement, even though it has been whitewashed for a lot of these centuries. Mm. Thank you all for sharing. So our next question is, um, what change do you hope to see within the next five years in your community or um, in Wisconsin as a whole or around the country or around the world, however you'd like to define it, but just like, what's the, what's the sh kind of short-term um, vision of this next five years for you all? And Amanjot, I will let you start us off. I hope to see a rise in green jobs and a shift towards more green jobs, not just in Milwaukee or in Wisconsin, but um, basically around the world. I think it's really important that we start from where a majority of things come from, which is our, our work and our production, is making sure that it's environmentally friendly and environmentally conscious. So it would be really cool if we saw more people working in renewable energy or more people working in um, making sure that the agricultural industry is still sustainable and ethical in its practices or protecting our water and our air from pollution and other things like that. There's a massive job market that is waiting to be filled out and I hope to see it fill out over the next few years. Thank you, Molly. Yeah, so I think that COVID brought a really unique opportunity for us in a lot of ways, right? Like, um, as, for example, my organization probably wouldn't have existed without it because when I started the coalition, we um, were reaching out to students and got students involved that um, I have never met from across the state. And they put in the time and effort on a daily, weekly basis over Zoom and over these like communication channels. And so I think that like without that, without COVID, none of us would have the comfortability to be like, oh, I'm gonna hop on a Zoom call and like talk to all these people and do activism with people I've never met before. And it became so hyper-normalized so fast, right? Like all of us are doing this and these types of panels 
channels are going to continue to exist. Um, actually, one of my members, Maddie, is here, which is awesome. Um, and like, I just think that the the opportunity to expand um, our communication and our networking across the state is just going to again like pop off. Like, I'm just excited because one of my big goals before I graduate is to build a like a much much stronger um, web of connections between all of the UW system students in like all realms of activism so that we're all getting like direct action training, um, you know, nonviolence training, like just different types of um, resources are expanded across the state instead of just kept at these like local levels where I typically used to work with just 350 students in Stevens Point, um, but now expanding that and I hope that just in the next five years, like you know, I think there's so many of us out here that that feel this way and are so upset with how things are run. And I just really hope that we can all solidify and kind of make some actual, I don't know, there's so much conversation, but not in a structured format and not in a way that um, we're able to push against the grain, I think, prominently enough. Um, and so I think that these communication avenues virtually are going to um, provide us a lot of opportunity to change that. Um, I have no idea what that's going to look like, but I don't know. I'm excited to see it. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. I'll send it over to you. I like all the points that were brought up um, by Molly and Amon. Amon John. Am I John? Am I saying it right? No, I'm probably not saying it right. It's Amon John. You're like almost there. John. Yeah, I'm on John appreciate it um but i think like like what they mentioned like the whole state being united something so key because i also feel like ever since i like have seen the outside of madison the disconnect between the rural and the urban is really big and so people think very different of madison and then madison people think very different of like rural people and then when they try like compromise to come together for you know whatever that case or problem may be it's really hard to find one common ground. And so, for instance, one thing that like we have often forgotten, but I'm like truly, you know, working on it, want to work on it, want to support the people who are working on it, is the whole idea of amending and repairing for what we have broken in the past. And so I want to bring up the whole case happened with Jacob Blake, you know, during COVID times. Uh, we, I think like, Wisconsin thought at all this time that it was a saint state. There was nothing that was going to happen here, right? It was not one of the first states that didn't allow slavery to happen. And yet a police officer should a black man who was trying just to defend something else that was going on and who had kids in his cars and now he's paralyzed. This story just reminds us how Wisconsin has so much to do in terms of racial justice. And until we address racial justice, we can truly address what is environmental justice. And I think that's what I really wanna look forward and what Wisconsin has to do in the future and what they can do better in the future. Cool, thank you all. I, I think that's a good segue for our next question, uh, which there's a lot of uh, concerns, issues, threats from climate change. Uh, but for all of you where you live or what you do, what is the most serious threat in, in your view to Wisconsin because of climate change? And how do you think it should be addressed by policymakers, by activists um, in a just and, and an equitable way? Uh, so I think the most serious threat to Wisconsin right now and that's only becoming more and more serious is actually safe drinking water and water quality. Um, this is an issue I've especially noticed both in my hometown and in the Wisconsin, like Brookfield, Milwaukee area. Um, two years ago, a student at my school at Brookfield East did a study on the water here in Brookfield and discovered that there were some really dangerous chemicals inside of our water that should were in higher levels than they should be and other concerns like that that were the result of you know, slowly deteriorating water infrastructure that is not being taken care of, that is not being patched up or fixed. And this is an issue that affects everybody, but especially black and brown communities where water infrastructure is most often neglected. 
And so there's also a race aspect here where, like, for example, in the Milwaukee area, there are areas where people are not being given water that is safer to drink. I myself have experienced this at home sometimes where the taps, I'll open the tap and the water will be yellow or orange and it for days and I just cannot consume it or use it. And this is becoming more and more of a common issue around the country as climate change gets worse, but it's a really serious threat to health and also, as I mentioned, a racial issue as well. So voting for candidates who solve these issues and protesting to make sure people and the government are actually solving these issues, water quality is super important. Thank you. Uh, Molly? Yeah, I, um, I don't know, the most threatening is such a hard thing, but I think what just constantly comes to my mind recently is the fact that Wisconsin in general is likely to be less affected by climate change in comparison to a lot of other care, um, areas like within the US and within the world. And so with that, like with our, um, you know, our high access to water with the Great Lakes here, I'm sure we're all aware of just how that resource is going to become um, a scary problem in the future um, of people wanting access to that water. Um, people in Wisconsin, we're lucky to have a lot of um, great soils for farming um, and for building on. Um, we have relatively cheap land to purchase at the moment. Um, we don't have high populations. And so um, there's a lot of great reasons for people to come migrate to this area. And so I think it's really important to recognize that we're going to have a lot of climate refugees um, within the state and within or just across the globe. And so this is going to be a pretty prominent area for, for people to move to. Um, and naturally, because those people deserve to have the resources in my mind as much as we do. Um, and so it's like, how, how do we, um, you know, properly distribute those resources to people throughout the state um, that are coming here, um, you know, deserving of those resources. Um, and how do, yeah, how do we do it in a way so that you know, people of color or, um, you know, low income people are getting those resources as much as, um, you know, high income um, white people are um, naturally, which is like a typical problem anywhere. But um, so I think that in terms of solving that problem, it comes down to just building climate resilient communities as we should anywhere in the first place. Um, that's why I've come so interested in building local food systems recently, because um, when we talk about climate, you know, we keep talking about like just the transition, right? This transition to electric and to like carbon neutral stuff. And it's like, well, it's going to come down to the basics of how do we feed people? How do we get them water? How do we house them? Um, and not just giving them these fancy vehicles to drive around. Um, and so I think about how it's so important to um, support local food systems so that we're not continuing uh, continually damaging our water bodies by, you know, just dumping fertilizers and nitrates and all these different chemicals into them and, um, you know, maintaining our soils and um, providing food for our people. Um, and so that that's probably just one of the examples in terms of building climate resiliency for our community and it's going to look different for everywhere. Um, and a big part of that is providing like unity again like throughout people um, Stephanie I thought it was really great that you brought up the problem between like the rural and the urban disconnect, um, because I find that that is another big problem as I'm dealing with climate um, uh, just there's so many different I've, I've lived in both areas and in like suburb, suburbs a lot and just seeing um, how people interact and how they discuss climate is, is just so different. Um, and so that will come into play too as we're developing these sustainable communities. It's going to look so different from Stevens Point and Madison to these smaller rural areas. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we'll kick it over to Stephanie. Like Molly um, and Amanjant uh, said, um, there's a clearly a lot of issues that are very important. If you like think about it in certain perspectives too. So I, I just wanna highlight, I guess that the main thing I would see as a problem that has to be addressed in Wisconsin is how to dismantle like capitalistic oppressive systems. Just like Molly said, like, you know, local food systems is so important because we cannot depend on grocery stores that are being brought from like 
miles away of food from avocados all the way from Mexico when they're not you know native from here but they travel so much and they increase your carbon footprint by so much but if there was less demand and if there's a will from the people we can make actually green jobs happen while also like you know not supporting oppressive capitalistic systems and so I guess what you're what we're I'm trying to say is that like we have to think and rethink the like the whole system reinvent the whole system in which we can rely on ourselves and not rely on corporations. While I support small business owners, I do not support corporations trying to tell us, you know, you have to do this a certain way or you should feel bad for, you know, getting a straw when they're the ones dumping all this water that's like perfectly fine, but they're using all their products and like Coke, you know, you name it, so many things and leaving so many people starving, leaving so many people out in third world countries without resourceful water. That's what I'm trying to get at. And I think that's the biggest problem like Wisconsin could get at just because there's already, you know, Milwaukee is one of the most segregated, if not the most segregated city in the United States. That's capitalism, that is racism. That's a whole system that we have to unpack um, in order to really address, for instance, lead poisoning, um, kind of like uh, some of the other panelists um, brought up the idea of like water, like water quality, how important this is. And this whole idea too of like air quality, like how do we wanna like implement factors in good jobs without, you know, making our air toxic? That's what I'm trying to see as the biggest problem facing Wisconsin. Thank you all. I can see this resonating with folks. This is good stuff. So our next question is, how do you approach conversations with other people about climate change and how can we make environmental protection a nonpartisan and intergenerational issue? And yeah, I'll let Amanjo, yeah, start us off. Um, I mean, as, as Stephanie really well pointed out, there is definitely a rural urban divide and there's also just partisanship and division in our country and in the state in general. And so when we talk about climate change, it's really important to make sure that we tailor our arguments to the people that we're talking to, because at the end of the day, climate change impacts everybody in one way or another. It doesn't just impact Democrats or anti-capitalists or uh, tree hunters or anyone like that. It impacts everybody in one way or another, and everybody has a stake in a better climate. So often when I talk to, for example, people who are from a more conservative ideology about climate change, um, I will talk, for example, about how it impacts the economy and how climate change could lead to wars over oil and water and how we will run out of important resources. Working class people will lose their jobs as a result of climate change issues, things like that. And that tends to uh, sway them to pay attention a little bit more to the arguments I'm making. Or citizens who live in areas where they haven't seen the impacts of climate change yet, they might be like, more likely to deny it or believe that it doesn't exist. But um, in those situations, it's really important to point to the science and also to tell them things in a more educational way and not talking down to them, not acting like they're dumber than you or anything like that, but trying to make sure that it's a discussion and not a, a lecture, which can make people a little bit more open to actually considering what you're talking about if they don't feel like they're being talked down to. It's also important to mention that a lot of people when they do argue that like climate change response isn't worth it, it's always important to ask like, what's the downside? I've asked this question a lot and this is one of those things that really gets people to like sway their opinion on climate change where if you tell them like, what's the downside of climate change response? What's the downside of a Green New Deal? Maybe we're wrong, maybe there won't be global warming, but and we end up having a cleaner, more environmentally friendly economic system, better jobs, wealth equity, how is any of that a negative? I don't really see a con side here. And that tends to also sway people a little bit. So those are some of the things that I tend to do. So um, I'll be honest, I think this is still an area I totally, totally struggle with. I, um, I think that so so first off, um, two years ago through my university, I um, did a research 
project um, that was basically like a climate change um, knowledge and interest survey for the campus. And so we had um, 2000 participants of staff and students and faculty um, just to figure out, you know, what they thought about climate, you know, did they, did they believe it was happening? Did they believe it was affecting the state? And what do they think we should do about it? Um, and so I got some really awesome responses. Um, I will say like Stevens Point tends to be a little bit more environmentally friendly and more aware, I think, um, and especially when you're talking to students because younger people tend to be more aware. But um, I was really happy to find out that like 85% of the people that filled out the survey um, did believe in climate change um, and did think that there should be like some action taken towards it, whether or not, you know, that, that gets fuzzy, right? Like what we actually do about it. And so I think that we're definitely at this point of discussion of I rarely find people that totally deny it anymore. Um, and it's mostly people that um, we just dif dispute of like, okay, like what do we do about it? Or what is what has caused the climate to change? Um, and so um, that is when it gets a little bit fuzzier. Um, but I think that my first go to when I'm having these discussions um, is to kind of put my own knowledge and just like ego and understanding aside um, because I kind of you know get in my head a little bit of the fact that like I read all these books and I you know read you know I watch these documentaries and I'm around climate all the time um, and so I try to just like separate from myself from that situation and just to listen um, because everybody has their own personal biases or relationship or reasoning for why um, they are deciding to not um, you know promote climate policy. And at this point, I don't think it's a lot of just like ignorance. Um, I mean, it definitely can be, but um, it, it gets down to to just the, the personal issues and like why they think that's gonna they're harm their job or harm their family um, if we do decide to promote these issues because they are you know giving into these fear tactics that are going on related to climate. And so um, like for example, my my dad's a climate denier, and so like having those discussions with him, um, a lot of it was just like listening and saying like, okay, like so so why why do you think this? And kind of just like keep asking questions so that they can kind of like go in a circle with themselves and realize what they're saying about like, wait, maybe I do want clean water, maybe I do want safe future for my kids, and maybe I do think we should um, you know have clean air. And so realizing how we get there and how we get to those different um, endpoints is regulation oftentimes and is um, these different environmental groups and these policies that they're voting against all the time. Um, and so a lot of people, I think, just haven't connected the dots. Um, but yeah, it's, it's different for every person, right? Like I'm gonna change the conversation based on of what their their preferences are gonna be. Like if I'm talking to a farmer, um, it's gonna be a lot of focusing on how it's gonna affect crops um, and how, you know, we're gonna have more flooding issues and crazy weather events and how that's going to affect them. But if I'm talking to someone in, in a city, I'm gonna be talking about the heat island effect um, and like what's going on in Milwaukee and how it's pretty terrifying that people are gonna, are, are starting to get sick and experience health issues um, from, from the climate. Um, and so you kind of have to make judgments on people a little bit, which isn't great, but um, I've just found that that's what works best for me. Um, but honestly, like, don't put too much pressure on yourself in terms of how you'd have these discussions because they're really hard. Um, and I think that I used to be like, oh my gosh, like how come I can't talk about this? Um, but like, it's an everyday thing and um, be patient with yourself and know that you're not perfect, so. I love um, all the other uh, pan all the uh, panelists responses to this just because like, I always learn something new with this question being asked. Um, I remember my first uh, couple of climate strikes, I would like, so there was a lot, a lot of counter protesters and people were, like saying like, you're being brain brainwashed by Democrats and things like that. And actually climate activism, the type of climate activism I do does not even like fully involve like Democrats. Now I'm not one side, not another. You know, I'm just, I know what's right. I know what feels right to my heart. And I believe that because there's no right ideology when you're in the extremist, extremist side of the idea. And so I guess what I was, I was trying to say with all this is that uh, I used to like get in fights with people. <laughs> like I would tell them like, like, you know, I would 
bring the facts. I would tell them, and I kind of like Molly, I'd be like, I know all these stuff. Like, you know, how can you not realize this? And sooner or later, uh, YCAP hosted this like event to talk to people about climate change. And a scientist, a climate scientist, like came and taught us that like the most effective ways people have come to agree, not agree with you, but like, you know, come to an understanding and where you're coming from is when you have a common brown, common like middle ground with them. And of course, like my identities are an immigrant woman of color, right? But then you, I could be talking to a small uh, farmer, you know, from rural Wisconsin, a white man. My, our identities are nowhere near in the spectrum. However, there has to be some common ground. For instance, in Honduras, where I come from, agricultural products are everything for us. Without that, our country does not make money. So I truly care about like, soils about bananas about coffees because that's where like you know my history comes from and i can totally understand why it's a farmer would be so worried to like move to a different like crop system like polyculture or irrigation system into a being a drip system and for the people who would know what i'm talking about it gets very complicated um but sooner or later you know i would have a conversation with this person and sooner or later i would tell them like what if this is all like jeopardize for something bigger than you can control but you can do your part so then next generations like your sons your like your you know your offspring <laughs> I'm sorry to call it like that but I don't want to gender nobody um will have then the opportunity to sustainably sustainably like farm for their families for their generations to come and actually with all this uh, I also tend to think a lot about you know the First Nations that are here in Wisconsin, how much we have yet to learn from them. Holy cow. Like I've taken so many um, indigenous courses here at UW-Madison, and it's just a glimpse of what I've learned on how they already had implemented sustainable systems to um, take uh, wood, to uh, farm, to eat. But capitalism has allowed us to exacerbate all those Especially, for instance, if you think about tobacco, something being so sacred for them, but for us, is now so widely prohibited because we have taken to a level where it's killing us. And that's not its first intention was with the First Nations um, and Indigenous people. So I guess the way I approach uh, people when talking about climate change is kind of like what um, Emanjot said, uh, saying more like, it's not like you are wrong, I'm right more like trying to see my own perspective I'll try to see your perspective and if we agree to disagree that's fine at least we had a conversation that didn't involve screaming or didn't involve telling each other calling names you know and going to uh, logical fallacies so that's the way I approach things I think all of you answered that question wonderfully um and that there's a lot of wisdom to pull from all of that so thank you this is the last prepared question we have, and then we're going to move on to audience questions. So just a reminder for everyone, if you have a question for panelists, please put it in the in the chat. We want to hear from you. We want to hear uh, their responses. So, but the final question, I think all of you have been touching on this uh, very well like throughout all these questions. So this is another chance to kind of expand on, on that. But you know, how can climate activists ensure that frontline communities, BIPOC communities, low-income communities are being centered in the fight for environmental justice and uh, the movement that you're all a part of? So I think Stephanie and Molly already in their answers in the past have pointed out a lot of things that I'm gonna say now, but um, for one thing, and for what is really important, and one of the things that we actually focus on a lot in Sunrise Movement is making sure that when we talk about climate change, we are specifically keeping in mind the opinions and perspectives of people of color, um, of the BIPOC community, especially uh, recognizing indigenous people and indigenous rights. Um, a key part of protecting our land and our environment is also recognizing who it originally belonged to 
and the fact that indigenous communities have this understanding of our land built into their culture. They already did sustainable farming practices before colonization. They knew how to take care of this land. And it's really important that we listen to their voices in the climate change discussion to learn better about how to protect our environment here in the US. It's also really important uh, to recognize how environmental issues affect specific communities. As I mentioned um, previously, like communities that are black and brown are more likely to face a lot of these pollution issues. I mean, the Flint crisis is a great example of that. There has been a lot of climate change issues already arising in some of these areas. Third world countries are also another example of that. A lot of third world countries have had to deal with climate change issues already. Like in India, this is a massive issue where um, people <laughs> have had <laughs> Sorry, uh, people of color in India have had to face um, a lot of pollution. And for example, there's farmers protests going on in India right now because of how unethical and also unsustainable farming and agriculture and mass production is in India and how it's slowly harming and killing workers there. So there are a lot of issues that IPOC in particular have to deal with as a result of climate change. And it's really important to listen to their perspectives and their stories and also their solutions, what they need us to consider when we have climate change responses, whether that's something as small as making sure like unemployed people of color in our towns are getting jobs through uh, the Green New Deal or something larger like preventing natural disasters from wiping out their communities um, and other issues like that. So, um... I don't think I'm probably the best person to answer this question because I, for the most part, most of the people that I have worked with in climate work in central Wisconsin are, are white and I'm, I'm not dealing with people of color on a, on a regular basis. I think that the most I can relate to when I think about this is again that that sort of ego discussion of the fact that like just because I think I know, or I have been, I've been learning, right? I still have so much to learn. And there's a lot that um, I always take from, or I shouldn't say take from, but I always learn from um, indigenous communities. And so, um, as we've said before, um, I always, anytime I start off um, my club meetings, like recognizing um, where, you know, the lands that we are on and taking a moment just to recognize that like a lot of pretty much all the work that we are doing is modeled after um, the values and traditions of indigenous communities and how um, impactful they have been for the climate movement and how traditional ecological knowledge will be imperative for um, dealing with climate in the future. And so that's something that stays um, constantly in the back of my mind. Um, but I also think about um, in terms of how to um, centralize people of color and just first uh, frontline people experiencing climate. Um, I think it's really, really important to recognize um, the privilege that like I come from and other students that I'm working with to say like, I am very lucky to be in the position that I'm in. And that's a big reason why I'm driven to do the work every day that I do um, is because I know that my voice is naturally much louder than so many people across the globe. And um, so many, a lot of our voices right now are so much louder. You know, we have like internet access right now or, or whatever our resources. And, um, and so taking that moment to recognize like the privilege that I have to use this voice, um, but then also um, taking the mindfulness in, in the moment of whenever I'm in these experiences to say like, am I taking up too much space? Um, and am I listening to the people that we really should be listening to in that moment? Um, and I think this is something that has taken me, um, taken a lot of growth for me over the last few years um, of just being able to, to learn when to, to, to shut up and say like, all right, this, is, this person is the person that we need to be prioritizing and listening to in that moment. Um, and so that can be a really tough thing for people to do um, sometimes. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I necessarily have, have the best answer for this one, but that's what I would say. I think everyone's answers are valid, you know, and we all come from different backgrounds and you don't, um, you don't choose to be socialized, uh, the way you grew up with. You don't choose your parents either. You don't choose your friend. Well, no, yeah, you choose your friends. 
and be careful with those. Um, <laughs> but I think when centering frontline voices, it's something so complicated because with that whole journey, you have to have a whole self-discovery journey. And kind of also what Molly pointed out about like her identities. You know, some of us do lie, have do have some privileged identities, others have some more oppressed identities. And by being aware of those things, we can then engage and be realizing like, oh, right now, you know, I'm taking up too much space. Let, me, let other people talk or, sorry, my phone. Uh, or let just like, you know, um, other discussions happen as you just witness them and as you hear them and what I found really fruitful in the past from like activism is like just being on the streets and talking to people since I'm always like protesting like people stop me sometimes they're like what's up what's going on and it's the brown and people of color uh the brown and black people of color that always be asking me and I'm like come and join us and the insights that they bring you know I try to engage um I have engaged with like Black Lives Matter protesters who are the ones who organized the, um, the, the protests here in Madison. I've engaged with the uh, Latinx uh, Centro Hispano who are advocating for immigrant rights, which is very much connected to all these systems of oppression, whether it being capitalism, whether it being sexism, whether it being racism. It's just so key to take all that into consideration. And so in the past, first, I did my whole, well, I'm still doing my whole discovery, self-discovery world. Secondly, I try to engage and incorporate as many voices as I can that I do not speak um, about. You know, sometimes I am at UW Madison the only person of color. So when they talk about race, all, I, all eyes are on me. But I have to be aware that I do not speak for every person of color. I do not represent every person in my community, nor in any other community and so there's a lot of variancy and so by understanding that you have to get educated first on why is that the case okay thank you all um so we it looks like we have one question we might only have time to get one through one question but if you still have any that are on your mind feel free to throw them out we'll see if we can get to them before 6 p.m or sorry, 7 p.m. That's um, so we got a question about carbon fee and dividend. Um, I assume that everyone's pretty familiar with that, but just in case that you're not, it is a tax on or a tax on carbon, taking the revenue from that tax and distributing it back down to uh, communities uh, as a dividend. That, to help them make the transition to clean energy and climate resiliency. So I'm gonna take this question, I think, and kind of pose it to everyone in terms of, you know, where do you, where do you see the carbon fee and dividend fitting in to the broader movement and conversation and goals around solving climate change? Um, and do you feel that there are any other uh, solutions that work in tandem with that just kind of maybe your thoughts around it. And we can just, again, go in the same order. Uh, are we still going in the same order? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, I did actually read on this. I This was part of a study that um, I did this year, my junior year of high school, um, where I studied, at first I studied like Green New Deal and carbon neutrality responses. And then I studied specifically environmental education that would help us achieve some of those responses. And one of the things I read out was um, carbon taxes and carbon fee and dividend and other plans like this. And um, they could be successful. Like there's definitely merit in a lot of these conversations. And the idea of having like a carbon fee and dividend as part of, for example, like a Green New Deal would be really cool where what we would end up doing essentially is we would disincentivize the use of carbon and use that taxation to be able to fund some of the infrastructure that we would be making, the green infrastructure that we would be making through the Green New Deal. So there is definitely a lot of merit in this and this could be successful. 
Um, on the other hand, it could also be like really controversial and kind of push people away from the environmentalist movement to make them less interested in it because they feel almost as if they're being punished for living their day to day lives the way they do. So it is really important that we market it a very specific way in this movement if we do choose to use it. But it is definitely a good idea that we should do. Yeah, I share a lot of the same thoughts um, that you just shared. I I think that um, it's 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 one of the many many solutions with the climate crisis. Like when when I think about all of these different things that are going on, it's it's definitely it's it's great because we have the opportunity to um, you know financially support a lot of the initiatives that we want to do right like with the green new deal and just different because it is expensive right um, a lot of this new because we haven't been doing it sustainably for so long and so to transition it is expensive um, and so I think it's it is a pretty good opportunity um, that we should take advantage of however I just don't see it as like an end all be all, which is which is sad because um, it's something that we just have to deal with with the the climate crisis as it's going to continue to go on. Is I think that that's why it makes it really tough for us to figure out what we're going to do is because it's just not this like golden ticket response of what it's going to be. It's going to look different for every town, and um, you know this might help some things, but it's not going to help other things. Like this doesn't like you know bring back the all the 90% of topsoil we've just lost, right? And so it, it, it's it's one thing, but it's it's not the other. So um, yeah, I'm totally all for it. I think that um, there's some policies that we need to be doing and there's a lot of environmental policies that we haven't been expanding on or just like there's no climate policy in general right now um, that we're using. And um, yeah, why not go for it? <laughs> if we can get it passed, we can get it through. I'm, I wouldn't be sad, that's for sure. It'd be a good day if we got it through. I like um, Molly's uh, response to this because it's something we have to like, you know, think about because this sounds like a great idea on paper. You know, the fact that we can like actually put a tax on carbon, decentivizing people to not use carbon, find other ways, alternate ways, um, and then reinvest this in communities through mental health services, uh, through, you know, climate resilient plans, food systems, like Molly responded. Um, but I could also see a lot of conflict. I could see how the communities being taxed that live in, in Trader Joe's uh, streets could also be infuriated if though that revenue that is being taxed from them could go to lower income communities because they could be saying like, I, I want that revenue to go into my communities. I don't see the difference change or changes here. And then that comes in the whole aspect of educating yourself or like why you think you deserve more than the people who have less. You know, and so I, I like this whole idea of like, you know, researching an idea and seeing what the potential is about. So if we can get it passed, I'm totally down for it, totally up for it. But there's like had to be more than one solution. And it could be not the one solution we can also only re rely on. Cool. Thank you. Um. So we've got five minutes left. And what I'm going to do here, we just got one last question and about some of your favorite resources for learning about climate change. So why don't we combine that with any calls to action that all of you have? So, you know, share a resource, a book, maybe a website or something that you think is really important for people to look into. And then, you know, whatever your call to action is for your organization your, or your campaign or your movement. So yeah, I'll kick it over to Um, Joe. Um, I have uh, one main recommendation and then one main call to action. Um, there is the documentary that inspired me to get into all of this in the first place is still on Netflix. It's called The True Cost. I recommend it to anybody who cares about climate change. It does such a good job of explaining fast fashion and industries like fast fashion and how overconsumption is one of the main reasons why climate change is such an issue and how we could even just by cutting down how much we consume we could impact the environment in a really positive way. And the second thing we call to action is that tomorrow is actually Sunrise Movement's National Day of Action to push Congress and President Joe Biden to work towards climate change response efforts, um, hopefully after they come back from their recess because they're going into recess soon. 
Um, so if you do want to sign up for an event through Sunrise Movement or go to a virtual event, I'm going to drop a link in for that. Um, thank you, everyone. I had a really good time today. So um, my, I guess I'll share two of my top resources right now. Um, there's a podcast called Green Dreamer that um, discusses so many um, of the intricate details of climate crisis and people that are doing activism in all different ways you know you have people that are like on the ground and then she'll have interviews with professors or people that have you know started their own nonprofits. um and then you know there's discussions about um the intersectionality with other social movements and racial movements um and so i think i just love that podcast it's it's very good um especially because i imagine everybody who's in this room like has a pretty good understanding um if you're coming to these types of discussions um that'd be a really good way to just like expand on some more specific knowledge so that was called Green Dreamer, um, the podcast. Um, and then my second resource, I've been reading um, Braiding Sweetgrass. I'm actually gonna grab it real quick because I think it's right here. Okay. Ugh, okay. So Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Kimmer. It's so, um, I, I feel like, again, I grew up as a city kid. And so like my relationship with nature was not very deep. I, I like I had this climate like crisis urge in me, but I didn't have a really good um, relationship with just like why, um, why I'm trying to protect this and this like relationship that I do feel. Um, and so Robin is really um, poetic in bringing together um, indigenous knowledge and um, modern science and how we manage our land and how we, we see land in general and how we see our resources. Um, and I think that a lot, a big, a big part of the problem with the climate crisis is just the fact that we have this like egocentric perspective and the fact that we see humans as like this land is made for us and um, it's a really great book about just um, braiding sweet grass and tying together the three and seeing how um, we can change the relationship that we have um, with nature. And so um, I haven't finished it yet, but I highly recommend this book. It's called Braiding Sweet Grass. Um, call to action. Um, honestly, I have been out of the climate world the last six weeks I was doing some stuff for school so I don't have anything big um, but maybe I guess my call to action is to go along with the book like take some time um, for yourself be sustainable in terms of your own well-being um, it's summertime and we spent a lot of time in front of screens so I hope that all of you can go and just like put your hands in the soil and you know find or do some sort of activity outside and really enjoy the awesome planet that we live on. So that's my call to action. I love everything that has been said. I love that book too. Oh my God. Um, it's just like so poetic, it's so pretty. Um, but I agree so much with um, Molly and, and Amanjot, what they said, because it's just like so key like doing all this type of work internally and externally you know so internally you have to like find your own connection have that one reason why you go back because with all this work it can be draining you can have a lot of people like nine out of ten times you'll have people saying you know no no but if you have that one yes being grateful for it and you know compensating yourself for putting all that work in nobody's telling you to but it's because you care and you can then tell your future grandkids you care and you did everything you could on your power to do that possible, to make that possible. And so I guess my call of action is during this summer, please, please pick up a book. Pick up a book, Color of Law, The New Jim Crow, Suspect Citizens. I could go on and on and on. Solana talks about racial justice. You can read some queer theory to all this intersectionality and ideas that one has not been exposed before to really understand how our, wor how our world is navigating now because it's very different from, from the past. And that's why as a more complicated, but more, you know, I don't wanna call it beautiful, 
like generation the, our generation is beautiful but it is um in a way you know poetic and it's a way that we have to incorporate our work with our mental health and our way of, of our way of being being sustainable you know all the practices that we do thank you all thank you all that was very very great uh appreciate all of you making that time thanks everyone in the audience for giving us your attention, giving the panelists your attention. Definitely make sure to follow through on their calls to action. Um, and with that, uh, we will let you go off to the rest of your nights. And thank you again. Let's give a like round of applause for our panelists too. Thanks y'all for coming.